Are y'all listening? What is the one thing that you like to do the most? Um, All right. I'm Jamie O'Kane, CPA, small business advanced tax planning and compliance extraordinaire. And this is the Abundant Beans Podcast, the podcast that takes my love for learning what makes people tick while digging into the good, bad, and ugly of small business ownership. We strive to give you the insight that only those in the trenches of being and working with entrepreneurs can provide. Today, we'd like to welcome to the podcast, Kathy Cooney. Kathy is a friend and colleague and all around super veterinarian. She's about as empathetic and compassionate as they come and has, a de- and has dedicated a large part of her, cur- her career to helping veterinary professionals and pet owners provide a good death for the animals they love. Check out the Companion Animal Euthanasia Training Academy for a sample of some of the incredible stuff she's, de- she's leading the charge on. Uh, and that intro was from our good friend, Josh Baseman. <laughs> Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Jamie. You know, I actually, it turns out I've known Josh Baseman for a long time. Uh-huh. And kind of for, you know, he was doing his own thing for a while. Mm-hmm. I was doing my own thing for a while. And then I reached out to him to see if he wanted to help me write an article on mm-hmm. compassion fatigue in veterinary medicine, yes, in particular yes. around euthanasia. And he says, yeah, let's go meet for coffee. So we sit down and he's like, but you know, we know each other, right? It's like, we do? When did, when did we meet? And it turns out that he used to run a practice in Boulder mm-hmm. that I had gone and done some training for. And he was the one who invited me in. So he had remembered me well. I had moved on to other things, kind of forgotten about Josh. And believe me now, Josh is very much back in my world. So hi, Josh. Hope you're listening and uh, you rock. Yeah, I actually interviewed him again last week. Um, and I was like, can we just do this all day? And he's like, Jamie, I gotta go. I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. (laughs) He's just one of those super go giver people. Um, but he's not like Disney princess about it. (laughs) Yeah. You know, he's very down to earth, but also super smart and super go giver, which is just like the perfect combo, I guess, for my personality. So I just love him dearly. So tell us, Kathy, what was your first job? Oh, in vet med or bef- well before, Jamie? Just like first, <laughs> first thing you ever did that like maybe they paid you five bucks an hour on. Wow. Well, I worked at a fast food restaurant in Rockford, Michigan. Oh, right. Yeah, my brother had worked there. I figured it was a pretty good gig. I wouldn't, wouldn't be too far from the high school. My friends could stop by. Yeah, yeah. I actually started in the food service industry. You know, it was really how... How I got rolling with things. In fact, when I was in vet school, I remember them saying, if you have waitressed, if you have bartended, then you're probably going to make a pretty good vet (laughs) because you know how to work with people. Yeah. Um, I actually had a whole podcast where we literally talked about why everybody should (laughs) be in the food service at some point and all the skills you learn as a server. Uh, Because I was forever in food service until, well, even after I graduated college. So I would still go back because it was like, it's good money, you know, Yeah, don't have how to sit in an go, office. How many people go all the way through, get their degrees, and then they're still, you know, still working Chili's and TGI Fridays because it's good money. Yeah. But I, I actually had to pull myself away from it. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. In fact, mm-hmm. I didn't stop food service work until two years before I got my vet degree. I was otherwise in the full swing of it, working until often two o'clock in the morning and and uh, reeking of cigarette smoke because I was back <laughs> in the day when you could still smoke in the bars. And, yeah. and, uh, but I just, I found it as a good catalyst for relating to people, connecting, just completely, completely compartmentalizing veterinary medicine and what I was learning on that side and just get back to being real with people and just uh, chit chat. Just good. In fact, my nickname was Chatty Cathy. <laughs> of course. Right. <laughs> I love, you know, food service is just one of those places where you learn how to like, manage people and manage tasks and manage, you know, but you get to like, you're basically your own little business in food service. Like you're running your own, like you have to decide how you're going to handle things. Um, I worked at Fort Fort Collins Country Club when I was up at CSU. So Kathy also went to Colorado State University. Um, So I worked up at the country club for like three three or four years. Um, And they had banquet, they had a dining room, they had um, the golf course, so you could like work in the cafe there, or you could do bar cart. So it was like this whole gamut of service options. Um, and I think I did every single, yep, I did every single one of them. Um, and it was so fun, you know, it was just fun to talk to people and, you know, it's always good. Bar cart was probably my favorite, <laughs> but that's just because the guys would always buy me tequila shots. They're like tequila shot. I'm like, just one guys. And then we're done. 
So you might say the first hour wasn't so fun until those tequila shots kicked in. And yeah. hey, and I always was amazed at um, how many people like to golf when it rains, though. Hmm. Like it, there were some like seriously cold days where they were out there golfing, and I'm like, what? What are we? Why? Why are we doing it's this now? Life. <laughs> um, so give us the cliff notes um, of your career journey. The cliff notes. Well, what I like about cliff notes is at least to get started is that it's still, it's still uh, developing, right? Right. In fact, that's what I love about veterinary medicine. I go many, many different directions, but the cliff note version. All right. Well, I, I actually was a horrible student. <laughs> just so you know, I mean, if we're, if we're diving back deep. I think that's awesome to know. Well, I'm very passionate about horses, always have been. And I grew up with a couple of horses. And when I graduated high school, I actually went to Michigan State University in something they called a horse management program. It was something that I didn't have to have a whole lot of direction for and, and passion. I just wanted to work with horses. Let's learn how to manage a horse farm. I was born and raised in Michigan. So it was a natural fit to go to Michigan State. And I had such a good time in college that I rarely went to class and Michigan State had to pull me aside at one point and said, uh, Miss Morrissey, which was my name at the time, my maiden name, they said, you need to grow up a little bit. And they actually booted me for two years. Oh, wow. they, they said, you just, you just need to go and grow up, have some fun, sow your wild oats. When you're ready to commit and actually go to class and have a GPA, you're welcome to be here. So through that horse management course, I had had an opportunity to go work in Montana in the Glacier National Park, helping Gorgeous. people with pet rides, you know, doing the horse concessions, and um, absolutely fell in love with it. And long story short is I ended up down in Tennessee working for a horse trainer down there. And what really resonated with me, which certainly wasn't cleaning stalls and necessarily just saddling the horses, getting them ready for training, I really enjoyed working for the veterinarian. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, here's maybe something I can do. I was, I was ready for the next chapter. And so I ended up um, starting my, my journey towards becoming a veterinarian, but I thought it would be with horses. I thought I'd be an equine vet. And when I got into Colorado State University's program for veterinary medicine, I found that I really didn't like the medicine part of it. I still loved horses, but wanted to keep them as a hobby. So veterinary medicine started to open up my world in different areas. I loved surgery, oncology, dermatology. You know, every rotation I went through, I was like, I love it, I love it, I love it. <laughs> and figured out that I probably just need to be, or start out as a small animal practitioner. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did for two years. And that's really what was most transformative in my adult life, besides getting married and starting to have kids and things, is uh, when I was when I was assigned to do the euthanasias at my hospital, it really clicked with me. It really resonated so much so that my staff, my colleagues would say, you know, there's a euthanasia coming on the schedule. Kathy, will you take it? Because they could also see my passion for it. And what I loved about it was that I got to slow down in my busy day. Hmm. And I got to settle into the room and have the full, the full um, blossoming of the human animal bond in front of me in, in full picture, right? Where I got to hear stories of the pet's journey and really got to connect with the family on a deep level that I loved. And it turns out I'm a story gal. Yeah. Right? That I listen to stories all day long. And even you had shared with me not, not too many minutes before uh, we started, you said that you'd lost a sweetie a year ago. Mm -hmm. All I want to do is suck into that story, right? I would just love for you to tell me, tell me, tell me. And so if I could do more of that in my work, how wonderful that would be. So I started to help more and more families with euthanasia there at the hospital. Then I went and started a, you know, offering it mobile, right? So I could go to the home. Mm -hmm. Now, this was in Michigan. I had I kind of bounced back and forth between Michigan and Colorado a little bit. And when I knew we were going to settle back in Colorado after a couple of years of private practice in, in Michigan, after I'd graduated from school at Colorado State, then um, I said, okay, what can I do in Colorado, in Northern Colorado, that wasn't already being done? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of mobile vets here in this area, and there are a lot of emergency hospitals, mm -hmm. but there wasn't a 24-7 emergency euthanasia 
service in the home setting. So, oh, no, so that's what I created. And that then helped me to move forward into hospice care, right? To help families, not only that they were ready to euthanize their beloved pet due to age-related changes, serious illness, you know, suffering that couldn't be managed anymore, and um, I started to work in the hospice. So how can I help these patients in their end of life journey feel more comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Palliative care, uh, helping the families with more pre-planning and all of that good, good stuff. So I ended up building my company called Home to Heaven. At that time, I built it up to 13 staff. We had nine doctors and four support staff. One of the biggest in the country um, when I sold it in two th at the end of 2015, and also during that time of running Home to Heaven, we had added a pet crematory. Mm -hmm. And we had done that because we were helping so many families with their aftercare needs. And one of my doctors came to me and he said, you know, is it, would it be wise for us to start our own? And I said, you know what, I, I'm all for the idea, but we have really good flame crematories already in our area that are doing wonderful work. I certainly don't want to compete with them. We don't need more good pet crematories in Northern Colorado. We had, we had enough. And I said, I don't really like flame cremation. Is there something different that's not so volatile and maybe so risky for the environment? And we discovered water-based cremation, aquamation. So in 2013, I started a water-based crematory as well. So, so Jamie, long story short and clip. I love it. I love is it. That, is that, coming to find my passion brought me into different sectors within veterinary medicine that needed, I hope, my help, that I could help to guide them to really good, strong home euthanasia practices, really good hospice, really good quality end of life around aftercare. And so I write books and articles and teach and do everything I can to advance the profession. I love that. So you, so, you know, most DVMs, they, they associate for a while or they open a practice. Like you were just like, I'm just going to do, go do euthanasia. That that's a different story than I generally hear from veterinarians. So was, I mean, you're kind of an outlier in that way, right? So you were like, I just want to go do euthanasia and do the maple, do the thing. Um, so home to heaven, were they one of the, one of the new, one of the most, um, sorry, like one of the earliest doing all the mobile euthanasia actually like it seems like a new concept to me but maybe it's not as new as I think it is yeah good question so very passionate about the history of euthanasia work in our profession mm -hmm. so I paid a lot of attention to the mobile sector and yeah so when I started in 2006 uh, with the home to heaven service to my knowledge there was only maybe about five to 10 other services in the country okay. that had already been honing these skills, right? Who had mm -hmm. said, I'm going to be a home euthanasia provider. So it was a pretty radical idea. There was uh, an early mentor of mine, Dr. Ann Brandenburg Schroeder out of Denver, who had a service called Besides Still Waters. Mm -hmm. She was one of the very first that pioneered this to say that it would be feasible to leave traditional veterinary medicine or you know other specialties that were out there and do something so radically different like just euthanasia mm -hmm. right like how could that possibly be fulfilling is there enough of a need that you could actually make a, a successful career out of it and in no time at all it became evident yes um, as soon as, as soon as i helped my first family you know within within a week the phone rang again you know, and then again, and by the end of the first year, I was helping 10 a week and then 20 wow. a week and then 30 a week and 40 and so on. And now that it's become way more mainstream, I mean, there's well over 500 home euthanasia services established in the country right now. And that's not even including the franchises that are out there, right? There's a couple that are out there helping, um, you know, that are tied to many veterinarians in many different cities around the U.S., you know, we basically, we early kind of trailblazers or pioneers showed the rest of the profession that you could do this, you know, you mm -hmm. could make a career out of this and love it. You know, how is it that we can, you know, perform euthanasia 10 times a day and still want to get up the next day and do it again? Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Um, I think it takes a special practitioner probably for that. Um, so, and you know, one of my questions around that is, you know, what kind of practitioners do you find like, 
most vets are very sweet people. They're all helpers. Like this is why I love talking to this industry, like talking to people and meeting people. Cause you all are like just good people who care about animals and care about people. Um, but there has to be a certain personality type or somebody that just wants to be a lone ranger or things like that for this euthanasia specialty. Um, you know, what do you find is like a really good fit generally? Sure. And that's, that's some, that's some research that needs to be done to tell mm -hmm. you the truth about what is our, what is in our makeup on our, in our, um, core, you know, our core strength and values mm -hmm. to move us towards this, this industry, this type of work, I should say. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can only speak to myself, as I alluded to before, that I just love to listen to stories. I love to slow down. I'm not necessarily well suited to the fast paced veterinary hospital. Now I'm a pretty fast paced person myself. Like I'm moving and shaking all during the day and different things. But when it comes to my veterinary work and what I find most meaningful is again, slowing down and just soaking into that moment, that space. Mm -hmm. And I hope that's what my clients like about me too. Right? In fact, when you hear most people talk about what they love about their veterinarian is that they're a friend. Mm -hmm. They're somebody that they can share their story with that's really going to listen, fully empathize and understand what they're going through. That's going to provide reassurance and affirmation that this is the right choice. And so if I can be that to my clients, then it's job well done. And I think that a lot of us out there that are doing that work also resonate with that. What I found as well is the type of veterinarian that are, that's gravitating towards euthanasia specific work. And in particular, we're talking about mobile work here, mm -hmm. right? Is that they're looking for their second act, mm -hmm. right? Or maybe they haven't found as much fulfillment in general practice as they thought, or they did for a while. And now they're just looking to reinvent mm -hmm. and harness those parts of their work that they love the most, which is often, again, just slowing down, connecting with families on that deeper level, and really being able to fulfill the true request of what that family just asked of you. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, you know, when it comes to wellness care or, you know, diagnosing an issue, diabetes, cancer, whatever it is, there is a lot of movement now in that case, right? And there's going to be a lot of ups and downs, a lot of unknowns. Euthanasia is one of the, is, is the main procedure that you mm -hmm. can think about where if you deliver the medication in the right way, when asked upon, you've got a clear uh, procedure that is now done and, and uh, seen through to uh, fruition. So for a lot of veterinarians that offers fulfillment wherein they not now worrying about cases in the long run. It's like, I've gone, I've done my work. I can feel good about it. And now I can move on to the next one. You know, that, that type of mindset I think is, uh, is very common in our work, but when it comes to the second act, Jamie, there are uh, many veterinarians in this space that have finished military work. Mm -hmm. that have sold a practice but still want to keep their hands in the business, mm -hmm. that um, maybe have a medical condition that is stopping them or prohibiting them from doing surgeries now or other work that they can still do euthanasia and love it. So it runs the gamut, but I think we, we need some research out there um, to say who is it that should be doing this type of work and maybe help those that are on the fence and say, hey, you know what, you actually check all the boxes. What do you, you know, could this, could this work for you? Yeah, um, you know, as I've learned more about the veterinary industry, I've learned, you know, there's just so many different avenues for vets. Um, and, you know, not everybody wants to work in a practice. People like to just be on their own sometimes. Like they just don't want to do employees or deal with that. Um, and that's all possible with a euthanasia only practice. And I love how you said, like, you get to actually do what people ask you to do. So it's like a hundred percent effective service, right? <laughs> like this is literally what is going to happen. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. And it's not to say that, you know, our hospice cases when we're managing those, um, mm -hmm. are wonderful because they are, we, we, we really like making a difference for these, for these mm -hmm. pets. But there is something about being able to fully manifest, you know, our calling for this particular patient. And then 
we write up our report and now we're ready to completely switch and move to the next one, you know, and, and hopefully exceed their expectations every chance we get. Um, so you had mentioned um, aquamation um, as, an, as an alternative to cremation. Can you explain that, what that is? I've never seen that before. Sure. So what's interesting about aquamation, and we should probably start with the scientific term, which is alkaline hydrolysis. Oh, okay. Is a, is a more of a lay term that was coined in Australia that many of us are grabbing onto because it really, it really ties to what we're doing. It's water-based cremation, so aquamation. It's a very, very old technology. In fact, it's been around for as long as science, you know, as long as the earth has been around. But to harness the, the harness the technology for humans and animals really only came into greater popularity around 30 years ago. And the, the reason that alkaline hydrolysis came to be what it is today was that the disposition of laboratory animals was very expensive, right? They would often have radioactive isotopes, maybe chemo agents, things like that. And it was very expensive to handle their disposition. So a couple of scientists got together and found a way to combine um, um, basically salts or chemicals that would be potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide to reduce away all of the body's soft tissue so that you're left with the bone, okay? So, oh. in, flame, so in flame cremation, it's a burning process. It's mm -hmm. called an oxidative process where through fuel and fire, we burn away all of the soft tissue and then you're left with the skeleton. So with alkaline hydrolysis or aquamation, we combine five things. It's water, salts or the potassium hydroxide, also known as lye, okay, very mm -hmm. alkaline solution. So water, salts, heat, time, and movement of the water, mixing of the water, okay? Mm -hmm. So my machine, for example, we place a pet inside its own private compartment, and then we have other pets that are in other compartments within the machine, mm -hmm. but they're segmented, segmented by stainless steel dividers. And then based on how much body weight is in the machine, we add in the salts. Then we close the top and the machine fills with water. And then when the water heats up to just below boiling, it's a low pressure system, just really hot water, the water starts to move and mix. And over the course of about 20 hours, the body reduces all the way down to the bone. So, yeah, so when we open up the machine and we look inside, we'll have a dog skeleton in its full state next to maybe a cat and maybe a pot-bellied pig or a chicken or whatever sweeties have come into our care. And then what we have to do is collect out the bone and we dry it. And when it's dry, then we grind process it into ash and then we can return it to families or we spread it here on our farm. So, so the really the wonderful thing about aquamation is that again it's very it's very gentle first of all and so once we place a pet in the machine we don't touch it again until it's done with flame cremation they do have to move the body they have to turn it okay mm -hmm. so that the flame contacts all that soft tissue so i kind of like the idea with this aquamation that once the body's placed inside it's not touched again until it's done the other nice thing is that the bone is completely carcinogen free because there's no charring involved. There's no burning. So that's really nice. And then we have a greatly reduced carbon footprint as there's no emissions that come up uh, that impact the environment negatively. And then one of my favorite parts of this, which was an added benefit that we didn't pinpoint until a little bit into our process, is that we can actually help to identify foreign body ingestion and bone cancer. So when we open up a machine and after we're done processing and we look at the skeleton, sometimes we find surprises. So we'll find a peach pit or we'll find a corn cob. Nerf or balls. We'll find underwear. What did you say? Nerf balls. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Some of these things would normally burn up, right? Mm -hmm. That you wouldn't find, but we find them because because the process is so gentle and that stuff doesn't degrade away. 
So we can help the veterinarians do some detective work. So if they think that, uh, you know, the pet may have eaten something, a foreign body, something got stuck, then we can look for that. Mm -hmm. And then if we find it, we of course let the, let the veterinarian know and the family know. But we can also identify bone cancer very easily. So bone cancer tends to sit in the shoulder area mm -hmm. or in the wrist or in the knee, often the jaw, the spine. And so if the veterinarian who sends us the pet suspects that there is cancer, bone cancer in particular, we can, do look, at, we can look for that before the bone is ground down. And sometimes that's missed with flame cremation because the bone is broken down a lot during the processing. Um, but again, when we open ours up, we have full skeletons laying right there. So it's, it's turned out to be very, very useful, very good for the environment, and we're very proud of it. And it's all over the world, by the way. This that's is not, really cool. Yeah, this is not just us in Northern Colorado. We actually have, there's four systems uh, for humans and animals collectively in Colorado, mm. but I believe there's about 125 to 150 of my type of units around the U.S. And then I think there's about 30 states that have approved it for humans in the U.S. And they use it for humans all over the world, though, as well. It's like an episode of Bones. Yes. <laughs> yes. You started describing that and I was like, don't they do that in Bones? <laughs> so, well, but I've also had people say it's like an episode of Breaking Bad. So I've, I haven't seen that. Okay. okay. Well, I won't give you too many gory details, but in Breaking Bad, let's just say they're not doing alkaline hydrolysis. Maybe they're doing like acidic hydrolysis. Yeah, so I was going to say that like complete opposite. Yes. Bodies and barrels. Yes. Yes. Very, very nasty, heinous stuff. But, but because ours, we stop at the point where we have the bone. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that is really what people want. They want their pet's ashes returned to them. And just so you know, if they don't want them back, then we actually give it back to the earth. We'll just spread it. We spread it here on our family farm, which people love. And boy, I, we, could go, we could go three hours. I love this. This is great. So it's a water-based cremation. So mm -hmm. it's inherent that there's a water left over, right? So we fill the tank with water. We generate what's called an effluent and that effluent is then usually discharged into wastewater to go to water treatment facilities to help feed bacteria there and, and break down solid waste. But I actually am sitting on a 35 acre farm in North Loveland where we do not have wastewater. We're on septic and we generate about 600 gallons of this effluent a day. And so what we do is we actually spread it on the land and give it back to the earth right now. And we're loving that. It works out very well. I've got beautiful, healthy, happy grasses. And we've got a woman shipping us her cat right now. I'm not going to give you more information than that, but she's shipping us her cat from out of state because she wants us to handle the aquamation and she wants her cat's essence to be spread on our farm. I love it. She'll get the ashes back. We'll ship her her ashes back, but the cat's essence otherwise will stay here on the farm. And that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Um, I think I believe our dog was cremated and I was like, and they're like, yeah, we'll just spread it on the farm. I'm like, baller. He, he will have a great time. That's awesome. Let's do that. I don't need to stick him in a something somewhere, but, um, you know, just so, you know, if you want to commit a murder at some time, you know, it's alkaline mix guys. That's what, that's what breaks down the, the skin and stuff, not acid. That's right. It has to be alkaline. <laughs> Right. And that's why we have, we have cameras and we have, um, we have codes on our doors. And that kind of stuff. <laughs> I listen to too much true crime, as you can tell. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So we went off with the script because that's my favorite thing to do. So tell me, sorry, we talked about that. So tell us about, um, so tell us about your academy. So you've had the Academy for a long time now. So tell me about the Academy. How do people contact you or contact the Academy um, to learn how to be a euthanasia pr practitioner? So let's talk about that a little bit. And then I want to talk about like the business side of building all of this, these things, the Aquamation, the Academy, all of that. Yeah, yeah it's definitely a, a work in progress to figure out all the business side of these things. I don't have an MBA. In fact, I maybe me just, I, I did some small business like classes at the local local uh you know city chapter whatever but um kept it kept it very organic as i moved through things mm -hmm. so 
you know, it became evident after a few years of doing my euthanasia work that I should have learned more about euthanasia techniques and methodology in school. Um, so veterinary schools have a certain amount of information that they typically teach about euthanasia, and they could definitely expand on more. And in talking to other practitioners out there, they're like, you know what, you just kind of get out there into practice and you learn, you learn as you go, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. you're thrust into it and now you've got to perform your very first euthanasia, your first week in practice and hope it goes perfectly. And many times it doesn't. So uh, people were reaching out to me, practitioners were reaching out probably around 2007, 2008, shortly after I'd started Home to Heaven and had heard of my success and they knew that I was growing really fast, able to do this home euthanasia service and, and make a living at it. And they're like, what is this magic, right? What, are, what is it that you're doing? So I started to write some books and started to learn as much as I could about techniques and even helped the American Veterinary Medical Association with their companion animal uh, portion of the euthanasia guidelines, right? So making sure that I could lend my voice to that. Started doing some research into certain techniques. But uh, what it came down to was all of these different talks that I could give and the books that I could write and articles weren't necessarily all together in a cohesive body of work mm -hmm. to help everybody to get the core competency that they needed in euthanasia. So the reason that I sold Home to Heaven now at this point back at the end of 2015, so four and a half years ago, was so that I could start the Companion Animal Euthanasia Training Academy. So I could really devote as much of my full attention to it as I could. And the idea behind it was a 10-hour course that's delivered in person or online and we say our mission statement is to provide outstanding education and companion animal euthanasia to improve the overall experience for the pet, for the client, and for the veterinary team, right? Because you got three stakeholders in there, plus many more, but those are your mm -hmm. three primary. And so we wanted to make sure that if life was to be taken, that it was done following our 14 essential components wherein the pet would have the gentlest experience it could in this last moments on earth, and that the client could feel good about their decisions, safe in their decision, trust the veterinary team, and you know, reduce trauma or, or um, you know, often victimization that they can feel if things go wrong. Mm -hmm. We wanted to protect their mental health so that if they you know, really wanted to get another pet, that they would feel safe doing that so that they wouldn't fear the euthanasia possibility again 15 years down the road, right? 20 years down the road. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of people that have had what we call a dysthanasia, a bad death experience, and never want to do it again, right? They're terrified. Mm -hmm. Or they will let their pet linger in suffering rather than choose euthanasia because mm -hmm. things don't work. So, so basically we wanted to enhance their experience and then make sure that the veterinary team was doing it the best way they could so that they can feel comfortable to do it again and again, reduce their compassion fatigue and their burnout around this, um, help them with what we call self-regulation. It's just a, a way to reduce compassion fatigue and shore up their behavior and their culture around euthanasia. So, so the Academy has these 10 hour core hours that we provide. We provide it for practitioners, veterinarians. We allow technicians to take it because there's a lot of technicians that can perform euthanasia depending on where you live. Social workers, grief counselors, practice managers, everybody that wants to learn best practices is invited. Awesome. And then right now, Jamie, our big initiative is to try to incorporate this 10 hour program into university curriculum, right? It's like you gotta go there next, right? <laughs> go there because it's one thing to teach the practitioners who have been out there for a while doing this and help them to hone those skills. Mm -hmm. But if we can get to those students before they graduate and build their confidence, and you know, within the first week, they got plan A, plan B, plan C. You know, if things start to get a little rough, they know what to do and they're gonna stay calm mm -hmm. and they're not gonna be as afraid. And mm -hmm. that is powerful. Well, and it gives it gives them another option too, other than associate, or it makes them amazing associates, right? So it just it just increases their ability to, you know, find a good fit, be happy in what they're doing. 
you know, the competency level goes up because well, euthanasia is just part of practice. Euthanasia is part of practice. In fact, it's been said that it's the second most common procedure in vet med is euthanasia. And I, I say it's been said because I'm still trying to track down where like, that came from. You're like, where's that data? Where is that, right? And the person that told it to me, I'm like, where is it? And I haven't heard back yet. So I'm going to say with good confidence that it's in the top five. Mm -hmm. Because when you talk to hospitals and you say, you know, how often are you performing euthanasia a week? It's up there. You know, it's up mm -hmm. there. Death and taxes, right? Right. So, so it's, it's uh, still the most common way for animals to die is through mm -hmm. euthanasia um, in, in vet med. But um, circling back around to it is that if we can, if we can build this as a core competency, it's going to help the students feel better about it. It's going to help the whole team in general. And the students, you know, some of them are, most of them, of course, are just going to go into practice, right? And whether or not it's large animal mix, small, they need to have these skills. But there, for the first time ever, are now students that are entering into veterinary school with the idea that they are going to be an end-of-life specialist. That's so cool. It's so cool because think about how many people out there don't want to be a veterinarian because of euthanasia. They just, it's going to be too hard, too sad. They, they're like, I could do it if it wasn't for the death side of it. Mm -hmm. But now we've actually shown just how enriching this work can be and that students will graduate and go into end of life industry. I think it's pretty cool. I think that's really cool. And, you know, in any industry, you know, the people that find that one service or, you know, a couple services around that um, and they go just in that direction. They tend to be happier. They tend to have less compassion fatigue, right? They tend to run amazing businesses for themselves. You know, like, you know, it's a great fit and it's a great like niche industry or a niche, you know, service to provide. You can just say, this is all I do. And That's you don't right. have to, you know, don't have to check out, you know, do all the different things that vets do. Um, you can just do what's fun and what you love. And not say fun, but you know, what you love and what gets us the, the most fulfilling. Um, and those practices probably have a lot, I know they have a lot less overhead. I have one of those practitioners in my book of business and he has little overhead and he makes really good money. And, <laughs> you know, he's like, this is awesome. You know, yeah. he's like, I love it. Yeah. It's, it's a chance to do, to practice veterinary medicine again in a way that resonates with our psyche, with our ethos. Mm -hmm. And and we know that there's going to be countless families who need our help. You know, in fact, everywhere, I mean, right now, today, there are going to be thousands of animals that are going to be euthanized for all the right reasons, right? They just, they've, they've reached the end of their life. And isn't it wonderful that there are veterinarians out there and technicians that can enjoy the work? You know, in fact, you'll hear all, all of us say, what we hear from our clients is, I don't know how you do what you do. This work must be so hard, but thank goodness you do it. You know, I heard it just today. I helped a sweetie and I'll probably hear it again in an hour when I help another family with euthanasia. Mm -hmm. That um, I always tell my families, you know, there's definitely hard days, but you're the one mm -hmm. with the hard job today. You know, saying goodbye to your best friend like this. And in fact, I didn't mention, but I used to do a lot of the mobile work. I mm -hmm. don't do that as much anymore. Instead, I actually have a center here on my farm where people now travel to me. Mm -hmm. and I added that into my offerings back in 2009. I just had this epiphany one, one night, middle of the night with my baby. <laughs> right. And, uh, and just in a stupor, just thinking about work, you know, when you do, mm -hmm. when you run your own company. Mm -hmm. And I just had this epiphany. I thought if people don't want me to go to them for euthanasia and they don't want to go to their vet's office, where do they go? And in my community, the only other answer was a humane society. And at the humane society, families wouldn't be allowed to remain present, Oof. right? It would just you drop off your pet and you go. And that's still pretty standard in most shelters around the country. So I thought maybe we need to create a nice, safe, neutral place. 
So I finished my basement when I was living in Fort Collins, Colorado. I finished my basement as one of the, if not the country's first pet euthanasia center. That's awesome. And it had a walkout basement and people could park on the street. I had to go through the whole HOA requirements and all that to get permission. And people were coming to my home and they loved it. It was less expensive. It was great for me. And so I thought, okay, let's take this to the next level. And that's why we ended up buying this farm in, in Loveland, Colorado. And it had a little detached garage. And so we converted it into our comfort center. So we have two comfort rooms here. And so now people can come here. We've got a memorial garden and it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. I love so I that. Love that, that practitioners can also do this. So they can have the mobile component, but they can essentially have a glorified office somewhere where families can also come to them if, if they want. It's like the best of both worlds, yes. right? Yes. Um, Cause when we were putting our dog down, he's like an 85 pound golden retriever who can't walk. And I was like, how are we a going to get him into the vets? <laughs> right. And then we have to leave him there. I don't know how I feel about that, <laughs> you know, but then I was like, my husband's like, I don't know if I want to do it like in the house. And like, I was like, but is this going to traumatize kids? And like this whole question, we did end up doing it in home, but it was just kind of like, I don't want to take him and leave him. But I also, you know, I'm going to look at the spot. He died all the time. Right. So it's just all this, you know, what is the best for our level? I'm also a birth doula. So you, what you're talking about is kind of likened to like a birth center versus like a hospital or a home birth. Like there's, we can do all these services in different places to, to serve other people um, based on what services yeah. we want to do. Yeah. To align with what is best for our patient, mm -hmm. and for our client. In fact, when we talk about end of life work, we refer to our patient as a combined patient, right? It's our, it's a, the pet patient and our client and our family and aligning with what's most important for them. Mm -hmm. So you did it, you did it the way that most of us would prefer. And that is in the home, right? That's your sanctuary. That's yeah. where your, that's where your pet wants to be. In fact, most of us don't say we want to spend our final moments in a hospital. So mm -hmm. the hospitals as it stands right now, many of them are doing the absolute best they can to make those comfort rooms, make them very much like little living rooms uh, where you want to just soak into and spend time where it's very safe, but the home is still the home and that's hard to reproduce or replicate. Mm -hmm. So a center like mine feels like you're coming to my home, mm -hmm. which is, which is really nice. So we would be that middle ground between, you know, your home and the hospital. So I hope that more services like that pop up and and kind of getting to your second question about business. Mm -hmm. Let's talk some business stuff. So what would be, what would be your first question with regards to, um, you know, one of my biggest questions is, you know, what are some of the biggest obstacles you've come across in creating your businesses? What's interesting is with, I suppose with all of it is just um, the public's awareness. Mm-hmm that it's an option. So everybody knows that euthanasia is an option. Mm -hmm. but what they didn't know early on in my community was that it could be done in the home, mm -hmm. right? So we had to evolve Northern Colorado to understand. And I know many other practitioners around the country have the same thing. So like in Seattle years ago, there were uh, my colleagues, you know, starting up their services and they had to do the same thing. You just had to build awareness. Mm -hmm. And then hospice, even more so. So mm -hmm. hospice, Hospice to let the, let the family know that there is support available to them well before the time for euthanasia has arrived is really tricky. In fact, it's not only difficult to get that message through to the, to the families, but to other veterinarians that we can ratchet it up a notch, you know, we can, we can, we can elevate our care and it goes well beyond, you know, kind of take these pills and call me when you're ready for euthanasia, that now we've got all these palliative care options. We can take this multimodal approach where we're doing, you know, pharmaceuticals, we're doing supplements, we're doing physical modalities like acupuncture, laser therapy, all of these things to reduce away the symptoms, right? So the pet can live more comfortably but try to get that information to the family well before, again, they need euthanasia. So, so just on a 
you know, running a business or building my clientele base, that's been a big challenge. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to um, acclimation, I won't talk too much about this, but I'll just hint on the fact that um, owning a, owning a crematory, mm -hmm. you know, I was able to uh, provide a lot of pets for my own crematory. Okay. But in order to get the word out there to other veterinarians that it was an option, a lot of veterinarians like to work with one crematory and just say, that's simply who we work with. We don't work with anybody else. And I would love to see it that the, that the veterinary hospital says to the client, who do you want to work with? And then they make that happen. Mm -hmm. So, so then we've had to get out there and evolve the community and let them know that aquamation exists. And so I would say marketing and awareness has been the biggest challenge. Yeah. I think, I think most businesses find that they have a hard time communicating what they do. Um, you just explained hospice to be a way that I didn't understand before. Um, like I kind of knew it was a thing, but now that you're talking about it, I was like, Oh, maybe we should have done that first. But hmm. He was, it's about asking the right questions. Yeah, he was not good. <laughs> Gary will bring it up too, right? To yeah. say, what are your hopes for this end of life journey? Mm -hmm. And then what can we do for you? You mm -hmm. know, um, that's, that's, that's probably step one because a lot of families are scared. You know, as soon, as soon as they see a major physical change happen where they think the end is coming or they've just been given a, you know, life limiting diagnosis of their beloved pet, you know, yeah. everything starts to cave in and it's very scary. Yeah. Um, so our golden retriever actually had, I'm just going to tell the story because you'd want to hear it. Um, our golden retriever, my husband found him in the backyard having grand mal seizures uh, the week before he turned 12 and he was like the healthiest kid before then. Um, so it's just super, super good stock, super good dog. Um, and then they were finally able to get all that in control with a bunch of meds. Um, and he bounced back from that for a while. And then about nine months later, he was just, he couldn't walk. He wouldn't get up. I had to like drag him around the house so he could be with me. And I was just like, mm, you know, I think it's time. Um, and his quality of life was top of mind for us always. And I told the docs at the emergency, um, if he can't come back and have at least a large portion of his quality of life, you just let me know because we're going to make the hard decision if we need to. Um, Cause that's, he's an animal, <laughs> you know, I just can't imagine, you know, dragging it out for us. You know, that was our, that was our choice. So we did in home with him, him and home euthanasia. And, you know, he's just so much calmer. Like, and that's the thing I couldn't imagine taking him, to the vets where it was just so like all the smells and all the stuff just always made him like, ah, you know? And yeah. I was like, you can't even move, but I can just imagine like him fighting us and whatever, because that's how the vet works for him. So it, it was definitely the best for us. That's where you know him best, Jamie. And mm -hmm. what, would, what would equal quality time for him? And you did palliative care. Yep. Because you didn't cure the seizures. What you did is try to manage them as best you could for mm -hmm. as long as you could. And you had already touched on quality of life components, right? Hopefully mm -hmm. what equaled quality days for him, what he would tolerate and what he wouldn't. Absolutely. And you were truthful with yourself. Yeah. You know, that's, that's really important. Yeah, it was good. You know, and I always talk about the experiences like, yeah, it was hard but it was absolutely the right decision for him. And it was the right decision for us trauma, you know, trauma wise, the whole family got to be here. Like the kids decided, I said, you can go to school or you can stay here or you can go to your rooms. It's up to you what you want to do. My kids are a little older. So it was just like, this is what's going to happen. You can be here. You could not be here. Cause you know, we all deal with stuff differently. You decide. Um, but he got us to do it with his whole family around him on the kitchen floor, like his most favorite spot. Right. And I was like, there can't be anything better than that, you know, or for the end of life. And then they took him and then I cried for days, but you know, I was like, ah, they're taking him now. I, you know, that was the part that I just didn't, couldn't get my, couldn't get my brain over. Um, yeah. Awesome. So what have been some of the greatest successes? So you kind of walked, you kind of said some of those things. So you built home to heaven. Um, you've built this Academy, you know, what would you say your top two successes have been in business? Top two successes in business. And it doesn't have to be like, I sold a practice yeah. or, you know, something, something normal. 
You know, yeah, I'll, I'll put it in normal context and just say that I am, I am a fulfilled, happy business person, right? That, that's the success right there. Practitioner, that I am energized by writing and researching and teaching. I am still very much energized helping families with euthanasia and end of life decision making. You know, it's, it's something that I have to have my hands in. In fact, I've got other, I've got good friends out there that are developing their career away from practice and now into more teaching and travel and, and speaking, which I think is wonderful. I have to keep doing euthanasia work, right? Because that is what brought me into it. And it keeps all of the material and content that I build and teach about fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. and so like, I'm very excited to be able to help this family here in about an hour that's coming in. And I look forward to it because it's, it's again, very, very soothing to my soul, very fulfilling. And I know they need me. Mm -hmm. And I hate to, it's kind of like one of those things where you build up an amazing, uh, what I, in my opinion, is an amazing skill set in the way that I deliver my, my medicine. And I would hate to take that away from the community. So I really want to make sure that I'm still doing it and balance it with everything else that I do. So I'll say my biggest success is still loving this work and excited to take it to the next level. I'm, I'm working on being boarded in animal welfare. Mm -hmm. and not a lot of practitioners are boarded in this area, and we should be, because there's so many different components of animal welfare throughout every industry in, in animal sciences. And, and so I'd like to build more awareness around specialty end-of-life work and, and doing things the right way. I love this. So, I mean, you just knew from the beginning that, you know, euthanasia is what energized you, and you've just built your life around that. You've expanded, you've changed things, you've whatever, but the core thing that energized you hasn't changed, the core service. That's right. Are y'all listening? What is the one thing that you like to do the most? Um, all right. So before I ask you my last question, what is the easiest way for people to find you? The easiest way for people to find me is probably through my consulting site. Uh, it's Kathleen with a K, Cooney, C-O-O-N-E-Y, dvm.com. A lot of people reach me through that site. And then through my my training academy, that website is CADA, C-A-E-T-A, international.com. And so I needed more acronyms. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> C-A-E-T-A, international.com. That stands for, again, the Companion Animal Euthanasia Training Academy. I am still very much the bread and butter of that company. It is growing and, and moving into bigger, broader categories, but uh, things take time and I'm just trying to persevere, keep, keep going out there with it. And uh, you can reach me through either one of those sites. And then if there's, any, if there's any practitioners out there that want to get involved with um, discussion, euthanasia discussions, discussions, I've got a great CADA Facebook group with a closed page or a private page for veterinary professionals where we talk euthanasia. That's awesome. And that's for social workers, grief counselors, anybody who wants to know best practices around euthanasia. It is not for, it is not for the general public or pet owners at this time, but um, yeah, I'd say that's the best way to find you. Yeah. You veterinarians like to uh, create groups. None of us can come in. <laughs> I was the other day. I was like, so can I, they're like, no, I'm like, okay. Um, um, that though, Cause I, I need to put a quick, word in for my blog page. So oh, yes. I write a lot about euthanasia topics on that cadainternational.com page. That's great. So if pet parents want to learn more nuances around this industry and help themselves with pre-planning, anything from home burial to understanding the history of, you know, the medicines that we work with to what is a perfect euthanasia look like? Oh, what are we trying to emulate? My blogs, my blogs are perfect for that. It's good to know what to expect. Yes. Especially in that situation. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so what would be your one piece of advice for any DVM that um, thinks a less traditional career um, path might be a better fit for them? If they have an entrepreneurial spirit, go for it. Yes. 
learn how to learn how to um, stoke that fire and in that area make sure that you really love to build and if you love to build then you go for it there really shouldn't be anything holding you back to explore what your options are mm -hmm. and then you know when you are meant to do this all the doors will open in the right way right isn't that is that what you find i think that's very true but i think a lot of dvms or the vets i generally talk to um they they tend to all kind of have an entrepreneurial spirit just at least a little bit you know because there's always just the seed of like I could have my own practice in some way because that's kind of the traditional route. So if you don't ever wanted to have your own practice, you might not complete DVM school. I know there's not a whole lot of business training. I know they're changing that now, but um, you know, I just seem to tend to find that most veterinarians have a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit about like how they want to do things, how they want to run things, you know, what's best care, what's best care, things like that. Absolutely. And I think, to, to develop off of that is that if we're really talking about moving into a unique niche mm -hmm. or getting a bit more off the beaten path, yeah, is to, to, to figure out first who you are and make sure that that resonates with you, right? Like, mm -hmm. are you going to be able to um, love this work? Like, you're going to be married to it. You right. know, if you're starting a new company or you bring in a partner or something like that, you have to be married to it. And um, I would just encourage you to do research ahead of time, really explore what the options are. But again, if it's meant to be, those doors will open. Don't be, don't be sidetracked or, or worried if you're coming across hurdles because my God, the hurdles are out there. You will find them. <laughs> but, if it's, but if you keep at least you know, one step forward, sometimes it's two steps back, but at least you're making some forward progress and it's meant to be. And just, you know, dive into all the resources that are out there for not only just reading books, articles, but the podcasts, the webinars, the, the breadth of information that you can find if you look for it. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. You are welcome, Jamie. Thanks for the opportunity. And this has been a ton of fun. Awesome. And I look forward to maybe connecting with you again. Yes, we need to actually have lunch someday when this is all over. Thank you so much for listening or watching. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, or wherever you prefer to listen. If you learned something and found some useful information to apply to your business today, please consider giving us a thumbs up and a review. Until next week, be abundant.